Hello, everyone. I uh, trust you're well. I hope you're well. I pray that you're well. And I thank you again for joining me on a book introduction and a reading. And uh, this book, you know, some books, they come into your life at the right time and place. And I think it's a function of relevance realization. And that can't be more true with this book being delivered uh, to my doorstep yesterday. Um, I've read snippets of it and I have read some uh, parts of it online, but actually I do not like reading books online. So I was able to get the copy here and the book uh, is The uh, Laws of Media, The New Science, and it's by Marshall and Eric McLuhan. It was written uh, late in Marshall McLuhan's life, published posthumously by his son, Eric, and their collaboration comes through um, beautifully. I've read uh, the first, uh, the preface, I actually read the preface and uh, did a video on it, but for some reason when I uploaded, the upload didn't go through and it erased my video. So uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction, uh, I'm gonna, a quick synopsis of the preface, I'll look through some chapters here, and then I'm going to read the introduction, which I read uh, earlier, and it is just uh, it's highly, highly relevant for you know, kind of the, the times and the discussions and conversations that have been going on on this corner of the uh, internet. I think you guys are going to really like it. And I highly recommend um, digging into this book. It was released in the 80s and the information in it is, is more, it's highly relevant again for not just now, but for the future. It's time has yet to come. Didn't get a lot of um, praise and it's mostly because people didn't understand it. And the origins of the book, um, the publishers came to Marshall McLuhan and told him that they wanted to do a 10-year um, anniversary update of Understanding Media. And uh, this book was essentially, essentially this update, but they made it into a, a whole book. And they had, um, they had trouble getting a publisher because the publishers would, would tell them that you know, they don't publish material books that have I forgot the percentage to 20% new material in it and this book has 70-80% new material so they had trouble finding a publisher um, the ideas and the concepts in here are kind of extensions and um, you know modifications and amplifications of the tool the tools provided in understanding media again understanding media is a toolkit used to explore media environments um, Marshall called uh, media environments and these environments recede again into the background and, um, and they function and operate on human consciousness and human relationships outside of our awareness and this is what this book is really um, honing in on is sharpening the perceptual tools we use to observe our environment um, which again is a very difficult thing to do uh, and I'll get in here. The preface was written by Eric McLuhan, and it talks about how, um, you know, just what I j just discussed here or uh, commented on uh, with the difficulties of, of publishing the book. Um, let's see if I can read some quotes in here. It says, this book, it was designed deliberately to provoke the reader to jar the sensibilities into a form of awareness that better complemented the subject matter, the subject matter in understanding media. This is poetic technique, science, if you will, of a high sort, satirizing the reader directly as a means of training him. A little bit further down, what do all media have in common? What do they do? We expected to find a dozen or so such, so such statements, but the first afternoon we had located three with relatively little difficulty, all present in understanding media. First, extension as an extension of man, the subtitle. Every technology extends or amplifies some organ or faculty of the user. Let's see. Um the study of the senses and of the ways in which media extend and modify sensibility needed systemic attention. So this is uh, that book that is, again, focused on this method, this tetrad that I've done a couple videos on just introducing the concept. Uh, the last two videos I did, actually. So go ahead and check those out to get an understanding of what the tetrad is, um, which was kind of the culmination of this book. And um, it's 
I cannot stress enough the usefulness of this of this method in this book uh, in a very interesting way. It's uh, hard for me to articulate right now. Um, he says later in the preface, as we show and as anyone can test, the laws apply only to human utterances and artifacts. So these four laws uh, of the Tetrad apply to any and all human artifacts. That means... Um, you know, from dishwashers to playgrounds to uh, automobiles to scientific theories to philosophical systems, any human artifact uh, can be observed and probed with this method. And they tested it out uh, pretty thoroughly. Um, what it doesn't do, what this system doesn't do, it does not apply to any natural um, natural phenomena, so earthquakes, uh, beaver dams birds nests um uh, s snowstorms right but it applies um completely coherently to every human technology human artifact whether it's art or science or gadgets or whatever it may be any particular technology uh, which is a hell of a thing i think to <laughs> to be able to decipher and let me see i'll go a little bit over the the contents um, table of contents here, chapter one. I'm going to read the introduction. It's about three, four pages, maybe a little bit more, and it kind of situates the the book in terms of understanding media in the in the obviously the the scope of this book. Um, chapter one is the genesis of visual space. Uh, more subsections: visual space and use, pre-Euclidean acoustic space, post-Euclidean acoustic space, the 20th century. Chapter two is culture and communication, the two hemispheres. Chapter three is the laws of media. Chapter four is the tetrads. And chapter five is media poetics. And at the end, they go through a long list of media to study using these tetrads. Uh, and I'm going to read some of the things that they use these four laws to um, elucidate and observe. It's actually quite, quite fascinating. Uh, so here's group one. For the tetrads here so booze alcohol brothel cigarettes the crowd drugs hermeneutics high rise kinetic space microphone pa system perspective and painting pipe refrigerator semiotics tactile space xerox all of these were put through the uh the tetrad cubism let's see what other ones the telephone the satellite um Arist aristotelian causality the car the cliché, clock, computer, Copernican revolution, cubism, electric light, law of effect, law of the jungle, law of new genetics, Maslow's rule, number. Again, these are all the um, media, the, the systems that are put to the test with regards to this tetrad, and they're done in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, pollsters, press, the radio, satellite, slang, spoken word, stirrup, telegraph press, telephone, TV, washing machine, written word. Um, and then there's another group here, airplane credit card, romanticism, symbolist poetry, visual space, wine, um, and then a few more there. So again, I'm going to start reading the, um, introduction for you guys. Thanks for joining me. All right. So the introduction starts with this quote from T.S. Eliot, uh, our concern with speech and speech impelled us to purify the dialect of the tribe. Starting in on the um, on the introduction here, you're just going to get, you know, hold on to your hats. It's going to be insight after insight just stacked on each other. So here we go. One fundamental discovery upon which this essay rests is that each of man's artifacts is in fact a kind of word, a metaphor that translates experience from one form into another. This essay offers in testable and falsifiable form the criteria of, the criteria of scientific laws observations about the structure and nature of things man makes and does, hence laws in its title. A second fundamental discovery, it makes no difference whatever whether one considers as artifacts or as media things of a tangible hardware nature, such as bowls and clubs or forks and spoons, or tools and devices and engines, railways, spacecrafts, radios, computers, and so on, or things of a software nature, such as theories or laws of science, philosophical systems, remedies, or even the diseases in medicine. 
forms or styles in painting or poetry or drama or music and so on. All are equally artifacts, all equally human, all equally susceptible to analysis, all equally verbal in structure. Laws of Media provides both an etymology and exegesis of these words. It may well turn out that the language they comprise has no syntax. So the accustomed distinctions between arts and sciences and between things and ideas, between physics and metaphysics, are dissolved. A new science replaces the current old science of media and artifacts, which is too narrow and too rigid, having drawn its techniques from the abstract method used since the Renaissance. It is a science of content and of messages only. The study of human media and technologies must begin with their humanity and remain steeped in the study of the senses. In 1620, Francis Bacon pointed out in Aphorism 19 of his Novum Organum that, quote, There are and can be only two ways of searching into and discovering truth. The one flies from the senses and particulars to the most general axioms. And from these principles, the truth of which it takes for settled and immovable proceeds to judgment. And this way is now in fashion. The other derives axioms from the senses and from particulars, rising by a gradual and unbroken ascent to that it arrives at the most general axioms last of all. This is the true way, but is yet untried. End quote. Uh, barely a century later, in 1725... Giambattista Vico explained in his Scienza Nuovo, quote, But in the night of thick darkness enveloping the earliest antiquity, so remote from ourselves, there shines the eternal and never-failing light of a truth beyond all question, that the world of civil society has certainly been made by men, and that its principles are therefore to be found within the modifications of our own human mind. Close quote. During one year, 1978 to 1979, we undertook the first extended investigation of the forms of space created by the eye and the ear. Visual space, as distinct from acoustic space, is an artifact, a side effect of using a phonetic alphabet. The alphabet acts to intensify the operation of vision and to suppress the operation of the other senses. We found that, to date, no field had managed any work on the subject, though it is fundamental, save for one article by F. M. Conrad, uh, Cornford in uh, The Invention of Space, as Bacon remarked at yet untried. The transformation to visual space from acoustic space occurred in ancient Greece. What took several thousand years to complete has taken us several decades to reverse the West now bathes in the emotions of post-literacy. During our research, we found that there had been great confusion for many centuries over certain matters crucial to an understanding of acoustic space. For example, the natures of, lo the, the natures of logos, of mimesis, and of formal causality. This confusion flows directly from the fact that all commentary and research, from rare Aristotle onwards, was conducted by persons to one or another degree visually biased, who assumed visual space to be the common sense norm. As a result, there are at least two forms, or rather, versions of mimesis and of logos and of formal cause. One of each has an oral structure and the other a visual, with the former conventionally regarded as a confused or tentative attempt to explain the latter. A few of the terms used in laws of media will be familiar to readers. Figure and ground in, uh, entered gestalt psychology from the work of Edgar Rubin, who about 1915 used those terms to, to discuss aspects of visual perception. They have here been broadened to embrace the whole structure of perception and of consciousness. All situations comprise an area of attention, figure, and a very much larger area of inattention, ground. The two continually coerce and play with each other across a common outline or boundary or interval that serves to define both simultaneously. The shape of one conforms exactly to the shape of the other. 
Figures rise out of and recede back into ground, which is configurational and comprises of all other available figures at once. For example, at a lecture, attention will shift from the speaker's words to his gestures, to the hum of the lights or to the street sounds, to the feel of the chair or to the memory or association of sm or smell. Each new figure in turn displaces the other, the others into ground. Ground provides the structure or style of awareness, the way of seeing, as Flaubert called it, or the terms on which a figure is perceived. The study of ground on its own terms is virtually impossible. By definition, it is at any moment environmental and subliminal. The only possible strategy for such a study entails constructing an anti-environment. By definition, it is at any moment environmental. Uh, oops, lost my space here. The only possible strategy for such a study entails constructing an anti-environment, such as the normal activity of the artist. The only person in our culture whose whole business has been the retraining and updating of sensibility. In the order of things, ground comes first and the figures emerge later. Coming events cast their shadows before them. The ground of any technology or artifact is both the situation that gives rise to it and the whole environment, the medium, of services and disservices that it brings into play. These environmental side effects impose themselves willy-nilly as a new form of culture. The medium is the message. Once the old ground becomes content of a new situation, it appears to ordinary attention as aesthetic figure. At the same time, a new retrieval or nostalgia is born. The business of the artist has been to report on the current sta status of ground by exploring those forms of sensibility made available by each new mode of culture long before the average man suspects that anything has changed. He is constantly making raids on the inarticulate. T.S. Eliot pointed, out that pointed this out in regard to Dante that a great poet or serious artist should be able to perceive or distinguish more clearly than ordinary men the forms and objects within the range of ordinary experience and be able to make men see and hear more at each end of the spectrum of their sensibility than they could ever notice without this help, without his help. Here's a footnote. The defined comedy is therefore a constant reminder to the poet of the obligation to explore to find words for the inarticulate, to capture those feelings which people can hardly even feel because they have no words for them. And at the same time, a reminder that the explorer is beyond the frontiers of ordinary consciousness, will, will only be able to return and report to his fellow citizens if he has all the time a firm grasp upon the realities with which they are already acquainted. Serious artists are the antennae of the race. Audio, audio and tactile spaces are inseparable. In the space created by these senses, each sense and each configuration of senses creates a unique form of space. Figure and ground are in dynamic equilibrium, each exerting pressure on the other across the interval separating them. Intervals, therefore, are resonant and not static. Resonance is the mode of acoustic space. Tactility is the space of the significant bounding line of pressure and of the interval. When we touch something, we contact it and create an interaction with it. We don't connect with it, else the hand and the object would become one. A static interval is a contradiction in terms. That is, it is either a misnamed connection or an empty visual space. Jacques Lusseren remarked of the awareness of tactility and blindness, and these few quotes from Jacques Lucerin, who I've never heard of, are just beautiful and, and kind of the main reason I wanted to just read this whole thing for you. So here's the first quote. This guy, this guy was blind. He says, if I put my hand on the table without pressing it, I knew the table was there, but knew nothing about it. To find out, my fingers had to bear down. And the amazing thing is that the pressure was answered by the table at once. Being blind, I thought I should have to go out and meet things, but I found that they came to meet me instead. 
I have never had to go, I, I have never had to go more than halfway, and the universe became an accomplice of all my wishes. If my fingers pressed the roundness of an apple, each one with a different weight, very soon I could not tell whether it was the apple or my fingers, which were heavy. I didn't even know whether I was touching it or it was touching me, as I became part of the apple. The apple became part of me. And that is how I came to understand the existence of things. It's from his book, And There Was Light. Lucerian is acutely aware of the modifications of his own mind, to use Vico's phrase, engendered by even simple experience. Much more profound and more subtle are the modifications of our minds and ways of life by our complex media. In laws of media, we can offer only a discussion of visual and acoustic space, although the further study of other senses and a full report on each one is of the first importance. Here's another quote from Lucerian. As soon as my hands came to life, they put me in a world where everything was an exchange of pressures. These pressures gathered together in shapes, and each one of the shapes had meaning. As a child, I spent hours leaning against objects and letting them lean against me. Any blind person can tell you that this gesture, this exchange, gives him satisfaction too deep for words. Touching the tomatoes in the garden and really touching them, touching, touching the walls of the house, the materials of the curtains or a clod of earth is surely seeing them as fully as eyes can see. But it is more than seeing them. It is tuning in on them and allowing the current they hold to connect with own, one, one's own, like electricity. To put it differently, this means an end of living in front of things and a beginning of living with them. Never mind if the word sounds shocking, for this is love. You cannot keep your hands from loving what they have really felt, moving continually bearing down and finally detaching themselves, the last perhaps the most significant motion of all. Little by little, my hands discovered that objects were not rigidly bound within a mold. It was form they first came, into contact, came in contact with, form like a kernel. But around this kernel, objects branch out in all directions. I could not touch the pear tree in the garden just by following the trunk with my fingers, then the branches, then the leaves, one at a time. That was only a beginning, for in the air, between the leaves, the pear tree still continued, and I had to move my hands from branch to branch to feel the currents running between them. Again, that's from And There Was Light. He remarks in, in And There Was Light, his remarks in And There Was Light, are the more valuable since he articulates in unusual detail the activity of each of the senses and its closure. More of the foundation of this new science consists of proper and systematic procedure. We propose no underlying theory to attack or defend, but rather a heuristic device, a set of four questions, which we call a tetrad. They can be asked and the answers checked by anyone, anywhere, at any time, about any human artifact. The tetrad was found by asking, what general verifiable that is, testable, statements can be made about all media. We were surprised to find only four, here posed as questions. What does it enhance or intensify? What does it render obsolete or displace? What does it retrieve that was previously obsolesced? And what does it produce or become when pressed to an extreme? Over more than 12 years of constant investigation, alone and with the help of colleagues, we've been able to, we have been unable to find a fifth question that applies to all media, or to locate a single instance in which one of the four is clearly absent or irrelevant. We issue this challenge to the reader. Can you find a fifth question that applies in all, or in even a significant many, instances? Can you locate an instance in which one of the four questions does not apply? Your answer is of the first importance as it determines the kind of our science. If one question is eliminated, if the tetrad is reduced to a triad, then, as will be discussed, we have merely old science, tricked out in new clothes, not formal but efficient cause and familiar method. 
If five questions apply, we are in another, we are in another, we are in other yet, but again, new territory. The four pattern has a special resonance and relation to language. Whatever the outcome, once the number of laws is known, and it will be four, then we can be certain that every human artifact will occasion exactly those transformations. Moreover, this fulfills one of the two great criteria demanded of any law of science. Can it be verified and tested? Does it allow prediction? Simply knowing in advance which transformations to expect, knowing where and how to look, lets you predict the effects of any new device or technique before they actually appear in time and experience. Various aspects of the Tetrad have unknowingly formed parts of our earlier studies, collaborative as well as private. Take today, the executive as dropout with Barrington Nevet, that was a book, uh, revolves around three reversals, from hardware to software, from job holding to role playing, and from centralism to decentralism, in patterns of management and of corporate culture. Reversal of the overheated medium from understanding media examines the tendency of any situation to flip into a complementary pattern when subjected to extreme pressure. The same book presented in the themes of media as being extensions of limbs and organs and senses, a kind of enhancement with profound reciprocal effects on the user. Enhancements, extensions, and reversals are fundamental to war and peace in the global village and to the mechanical bride and culture is our business. The Bride examines advertising before TV had hit North America. CB after. The Gutenberg Galaxy spells out in detail, as it were, one chapter of the later understanding media, the like needs to be done for each of the others. But the Galaxy primarily reports on the ascendancy of vision over the other senses. Through the vanishing point, space in poetry and in painting, with Harley Parker, takes the study of the senses to their home ground, the arts, and demonstrates how to use aphorism, probe, and juxtaposition as the study techniques, as study techniques. Another approach is tried with Dick Showick in Voices of Literature. The indispensable tool, figure ground, and interval for transformation analysis appears in various later works such as Take Today and City as Classroom. The two laws of obsolescence and retrieval, the whole complex retrieval and renewal process, form the basis of the study, from cliché to archetype. Conventional old science, entirely dominated by visual bias, cannot get a foothold in these areas. The new science is at once a, a synthesis and a leap into radicality, radically new territory. We subjoin we subjoin it to the Novum Organum of Bacon and the Scienza Nuova of Vico and to the long tradition of which they form a part. Having gleefully scrapped our traditions in headlong pursuit of the demon of progress, now that the Westerners embrace post-literacy, we find no roots or resonance in alphabetic culture. Prior to literacy, the job of transmitting the accumulated knowledge of the culture was given to the poets. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are meticulously encoded encyclopedias of the arts, manners, sciences, and mores of his Greece. After writing, the Logos was smashed and the oral establishment drowned in a sea of ink. Fragments of the old system were soon retrieved and recast in the pattern that became the Trivium and the Quadrivium, or Seven Liberal Arts. The Trivium comprised grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, the quadrivium, arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music. The trivium is our concern. All three of its elements are our arts and sciences of language. Rhetoric concerns speech. Its groundwork is transforming audiences. Grammar, Greek for literature, concerns the interpretation of written texts and the ground patterns in words, etymology. Dialectic specializes in the word as thought, and in the content of words and of thought, and in the systems of right thinking. Having no inherent ground, dialectic is abstract and co-ops rhetoric and grammar as a sort of external ground. It comprises two activities, logic and philosophy, and is the fountainhead of method and old science. 
The natural affinity between rhetoric and grammar springs in part from each having both figure and ground elements, and in part from both concerning words as presented to the exterior senses in writing and speech. Grammatical commentary on, on and interpretations of texts, first of the poets and later of the Christian scriptures, was ever regarded as a cumulative and collaborative enterprise. So the tradition of learning, the translation studi, formed as a deliberate offshoot. The natural complementarity of scripture and tradition remains vital. For example, in the Catholic Church, as the twin sources of revelation, each serves as ground for the other. Christian grammarians found a congenial figure-ground figure interplay between scripture and nature, Latin for about to be born, in Genesis where the creation is presented as, as a divine speech. Accordingly, they bent their efforts to developing parallel techniques for interpreting the quote-unquote two books, which they regarded as fully complementary, as warp and woof. Equally interwoven in picking out the details were the twin sciences of writing and speech, grammar and rhetoric. In fact, their alliance had begun well before Christianity. It persisted unbroken for some 2,000 years. In all this, the sister science dialectic stands a bit to one side. The alliance was further cemented in language. Rome had no single word to translate the Greek term for uh, to translate the Greek term or for word or utterance, logos, instead it used the phrase ratio at quo oratio, roughly reason and speech. The phrase provided a basis for the pat formula or the ideal man of learning as one possessed of wisdom, master of grammatical tradition and technique, and eloquence. The ideal survives, vigorous as ever, in our time. T.S. Eliot used, to, used it to discuss the importance of Mr. Pound. Because of their conservative attachment to tradition, grammarians and rhetoricians were ever styled ancients, while dialecticians, who in each age proposed marvelous new systems and methods for organizing knowledge and thought and endeavor, were styled moderns. The proverbial rivalry between the two camps and their intellectual wars continue apace today, albeit largely unknown to the combatants. With Laws of Media, we launch a fresh campaign in the war against the futility of deploying the science of the moderns of recent decades and centuries to deal with the matters of media as distinct, form, as distinct from messages. Now, although both Vico and Bacon, the two other generals in the field, are universally and quite ironically accounted philosophers, both are thoroughgoing ancients. Vico is a professor of rhetoric. His Scienza Nuova employs etymology and exegesis and mobilizes the full canon of traditional poetic wisdom. The full title of Bacon's Sally is the New Argonon, or True Directions Concerning the Interpretation of Nature. We mention these matters for purposes of orientation. Where dialectic is, inevitable, is, ne where dialectic is inevitably theoretical, grammar and rhetoric are always empirical first. And here's a subnote. Uh, Maurice, Maurice Merleau-Ponty has put the matter succinctly, quote, A concrete philosophy is not a happy one, he writes. It cannot have ground and be abstract at the same time. It must stick close to experience, and yet not limit itself to the empirical, but restore each experience the ontological cipher which marks it internally. As difficult as it is under these conditions to imagine the future of philosophy, two things seem certain. It, never, it will never regain the conviction of holding the keys to nature or history in its concepts, and it will not renounce its radicalism and search for presuppositions and foundations which has produced the great philosophers. It would appear then when, that when ground is added to dialect, to old science, it flips into grammar, new science. Adding ground flips the concept, concept approach into percepts, from the abstract contents alone to the book of nature as a whole. Both grammar and dialectic are concerned with the word in things. Dialectic with the word or ideal thought in the mind, pure before speech. Grammar with the word in, in informing or even as things about us outside the mind and body. The difference between them is exactly rhetoric utterance, which thus belongs to grammar. Back to the text. 
A complete history of the three arts together does not exist and is badly needed, for all three are reasserting themselves now at the close of the second millennium, as never before. With the knowledge of the trivium, for example, it is fairly easy to see why much of modern linguistics and semiotics, as presently con constituted, will not succeed. Or to see the root problem of phenomenology, namely that it is an all-out attempt by dialectic to invent or turn itself into grammar to force, so, to force some sort of ground to surface. Last paragraph here. A theoretical science has to begin with knowledge and theory, empirical science with ignorance and bias. The one is rooted in concepts, the other in percepts. The first cannot succeed unless it has an apparatus for locating and remedying flaws in reasoning, nor can the latter without a similar apparatus to detect and compensate for sensory bias. So the one proceeds by figure alone, the other by ground and figure. Francis Bacon noted it in his preparatory study of the advancement of learning, quote, For the mind of man is far from the nature of a clear and equal glass, wherein the beams of things should reflect according to their true in incidence. Nay, it is rather like an enchanted glass, full of superstition and imposture, close quote. Early in the new science, he developed these notions as a foundation for a detailed theory of communication, that is, of effects and of perceptual bias. It takes the form of his four idols, which, whoring after false gods, is strong red herring hauled across the path of right awareness. Vico, next to take arm, up on, Vico, next to take up arms, begins by reiterating and updating. Bacon's idols as his own first four axioms. Each is a form of blindness or insensitivity, personal or cultural, to a part of the spectrum. Our science accounts for these and in some measure compensates for them by the tools of figure and ground and the opening discussion of the sensory bias imposed on us by our extensions. It would be arrogant to profess that we, going the same road as Vico and Bacon and the ancients, have produced something better and to do so would be set up a rivalry between us at, that at best would make an irrelevant distraction. Instead, as Bacon said in his preface to Novum Organum, quote, my object being to open a new way for the understanding, a way by the ancients tried and unknown. The case is altered. Party zeal and emulation are at an end, and I appear merely as a guide to point out to the road, an office of small authority, and depending more upon a kind of luck than upon any ability or excellency. So there you have it. That is the introduction. Um, let me know what you guys think if you've gotten this far. And um, I'll see if I can read some more, maybe the next chapter for you guys. So if you're interested, highly recommend purchasing the book. Um, and I will see you soon. Thanks.